It is always on the first Sunday of every November, and it has become our custom to observe this special day. We want to highlight some of the horrible suffering that many of our brothers and sisters in Christ are experiencing around the world that virtually goes unnoticed by the rest of the world. And sadly, in many instances, it's unnoticed by many in the church as well. It's one of those things out of sight, out of mind. Nobody ever thinks about it. But I was made aware of it many years ago. And as your pastor, I have never been able in good conscience to not observe this day. Because I think it's something that we all need to be aware of. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we are part of the body of Christ. And so we need to remember them on a regular basis. First of all, because we are all one in Christ, and when one member of the body suffers, the whole body suffers. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 3 says, Remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. So we are part of that one body. Secondly, as we remember them, we must pray for them. And I'm pre- I appreciate what, uh, what our brother Walt had to say about prayer this morning. And uh, Corey Ten Boom was no stranger to persecution and suffering. But they covet your prayers more than anything else. And when they are asked, what can we do for you, that's their number one answer. So we're going to take some time in a little bit to do just that. Because as we do, we join churches all over the world and make intercession for them. We go to the throne of grace together, lifting up specific needs. And as you have a bulletin, you'll notice there's some information in there. Uh, And if you don't have anything, when it comes time, I'll pass it out to you so that you'll have something before you. But we want to remember this day and devote a portion of the day and, uh, and probably beyond when you leave this place Uh, Just to remember that there are people who love the Lord Jesus Christ at a great cost. We here in America really don't understand truly what it costs to follow Christ. But, uh, But that doesn't mean we shouldn't be made to be aware of it. Because one day it may come our way. Then thirdly, we need to know why God allows such suffering so we can learn from God's word, from their example, how to pray, how we can endure whenever the world turns against us. And it already has, just in our country, it's not that severe. But the world will one day turn against us. The world hates Jesus, and Jesus said, if the world hates me, it will hate you too. And as God would have it, today we are in that particular passage of Scripture that fits right in with what we're going to talk about today to address the issue. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to... (laughs) You can turn to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1, and uh, we're going to look at verses 27 through 30 but in particular verses 29 through 30. Because Paul draws a direct link between living worthy. That's what we talked about last time. How are we going to live worthy of Christ, of the gospel of Christ, which he commanded us to do? That's something, it's not a suggestion, it's not an idea. It is something that we are mandated to live worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it connects with the suffering which it will inevitably cause so he says verse 27 and 28 only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come and see you or am absent I may hear of your affairs that you may stand fast in one spirit with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel and not in any way terrified by your adversaries which is to them a proof of perdition 
but to you of salvation and that from God. So Paul here is just saying, he says, whether I am set free from this prison and I'm able to come be with you again, or whether I die here, it doesn't matter which, may I hear that you have remembered what I have commanded you to do, what I have encouraged you to do, to walk worthy of the Lord Jesus, that you live your lives showing the infinite worth of Jesus Christ and his message of salvation, that you stand fast in the unity of the Spirit, and that you are fervently working together to make the gospel known, and that you live courageously, not letting those who oppose you intimidate you or prevent you from going forth with the gospel. And then he follows that up in verse 29 and 30. For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. Having the same conflict which you saw in me, and now here is in me. That word granted in the Greek is karitzomai. It means to freely and graciously give or bestow. It's the same word that is used in Romans chapter 8 and verse 32 where Paul writes, He who did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all, how shall, shall he not with him also freely give, karitzomai, us all things? The, word, the root word here is charis, and that's the word for grace. Grace, you may know, is God's undeserved favor. It's unmerited. You can't earn it. You don't deserve it. The only thing we deserve from God is judgment because of our sin. But thank God we had Jesus who took that judgment in our place. And thereby having mercy on us. And uh, the idea of suffering for Christ as a gift is somewhat foreign to us. We, we don't always think of suffering as a gift. It's difficult for some of us to understand, but it is a tool that God can use in effectively making the gospel known in the world. It's actually a gift from him that enables us to more effectively make Christ known. Nobody likes to suffer. We don't want to suffer. But what he's saying is if we are living worthily, you will suffer in some measure, in some degree. People around the world are severely suffering. Ours, not so much. But if we're living godly in Christ Jesus, we will face adversity from the world. And he enables, he enables us with this suffering to be more effective in fulfilling the Great Commission. And what is the Great Commission? Every Christian should know this. Every Christian should have this portion of Scripture memorized Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. And this is a mandate. This is commanded. And it's not just for the missionaries or the preachers or the evangelists. It's for everybody who knows Christ. Once we become believers, once we are in Christ, we have a message that the world needs and we become ministers of reconciliation. We become ambassadors for Christ. We, we, we become representatives of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords with a message from him that Jesus saves. And so, friends, not only does our salvation come from the Lord as a gift, but we also have to recognize that salvation, or rather suffering, will come as a gift as well. And I need to make a distinction here about suffering. Paul is not talking about the normal suffering that results from the daily events of life. Sickness, disease, accidents, all those kinds of things. We all go through those things. But this one here is reserved for Christians. Suffering for Christ's sake. Because of what he's done for us. It's suffering due to living for Jesus. And from the very beginning in the scriptures, 
the apostles started off in, in the book of Acts, and you can read, they said, we must obey Christ, God rather than men, Acts 5.29. And a few verses later, it says they flogged them and ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and then released them. So they went on their way uh, from the presence of the council rejoicing that they had been counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Now who gets flogged and goes away rejoicing? This is a supernatural response to suffering. And it's only possible when you and I are living and walking in the power of the Spirit, when we are living worthy of Christ. That's the only way we can rejoice. And the attacks and the suffering didn't stop them. And every day in the temple from house to house they went, they kept right on teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ, as their Messiah. And so Paul writes to Timothy and he says, yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ, or in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. So the question for us is, are we willing? I mean, if we know the Lord Jesus Christ, are we willing to suffer? Because we've been called to it. We've been granted this as a gift. And in America, as I said, we don't go through the pain and suffering of beatings and imprisonment and death, but we're still going to be hated and opposed if we speak up for Christ and for righteousness sake you're going to you're going to be called a hater if if you speak righteously of the scriptures and you say something like homosexuality is a sin or you're going to be a hater of women if you say abortion is anti-women or if you say abortion is a violation of God's law, and then they'll say that you're a hater of women. You call, you'll be called self-righteous and approved if you're hanging out with the guys at work and they're all telling dirty jokes and you don't want to be a part of it. Anybody ever gone through that? And if you're a young person and you want to stay sexually pure and save that for marriage, you're going to get made fun of. You're a weirdo. You're a prude. You'll be sued if you want to refuse to celebrate the gay lifestyle by taking photos or baking a cake in celebration of gay marriage. Our adversity is nothing, however, compared to how bad it is for what others are going through around the world. We're facing it, and it's beginning to elevate. It's starting to heat up. But we're nowhere near where others across the world are experiencing. Remember, Paul explained to them in verse 12, he says, but I want you to know Brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel, but now actually have turned out, or have now happened to me, have turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. And now he's informing them that this suffering is, is part of God's sovereign plan to make the gospel spread. And I think a lot of Christians would be shocked to hear something like this. Because you don't hear it from a lot of pulpits about suffering. Some preachers don't even have a theology of suffering. It's not in their vocabulary. It's not in their understanding of God. And so their people think, hey, what's this about? I didn't ask for this. This isn't what I signed up for. Don't I have a right to be happy and prosperous and blessed? You know what the answer to that question is? No, you don't. I mean, we all want to be prosperous and happy and blessed. We don't have a right to it. When you talk about being happy, happiness depends upon our circumstances. If things are going well, then I can be happy. And if things start turning south, then happiness is far away. But God never promised anybody a life of ease. 
Why should any of us have a right to be happy when we don't ever even give consistently the honor and glory that Jesus deserves by giving his life and suffering incredibly for us? We can't imagine what he's been through for us. Why should we be so blessed and happy when he went through all of that for us? Not in our wildest dreams can we imagine what he went through. But what God, do, what God does promise is not happiness, but he does promise joy. That's why the disciples could go away rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer for Christ. That's why Paul and Silas were singing hymns of praise in the middle of the night when they were in the prison in Philippi. That's why he writes this letter from prison, and the whole letter is just exudes with joy. But joy is found only in him. And of course, yes, God does want us to prosper. But the kind of prosperity that God wants for all of us is spiritual prosperity, not necessarily financial prosperity. He can give you financial prosperity and health prosperity. He can do that, but you're not promised that. Try preaching a message of prosperity in a place like Somalia. How's that going to go over with those that are, that are dying of starvation? That's not the gospel. The prosperity is spiritual, and those people that are in those countries that are experiencing such suffering, their prosperity just, just outweighs all of ours like you couldn't understand. They are so spiritual, many of them, in their walk with Christ. They've experienced a spiritual prosperity, but they don't have anything to their name. That's one of the reasons why I love that song, Give Me Jesus, so much. Because in the Civil War era, era that song was written by slaves. People who had no freedom, they owned nothing, they were beaten, and they were persecuted. And yet they sing a song and say, you can have all this world, but give me Jesus. That is spiritual prosperity, brethren. And of course, he wants us to be blessed. Remember, Jesus said, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So God tells us it is possible to rejoice in a supernatural way. We can rejoice in our suffering when we're beaten, when we're in prison, when we're threatened with death. It is possible for us to know the joy of the Lord. It's so foreign to us, we get our panties in a bunch when we get stuck in traffic. You know, it, it's just, we get upset over the stupidest things. And these people that we're going to pray for today, they've lost loved ones, they've lost freedom, they've lost their limbs, they have nothing, but they have Christ. And God tells us it's possible to respond supernaturally when we're being reviled or mocked for living a life that is worthy of the gospel of Christ. He says in Peter, he writes to Peter, Peter was writing to a suffering church, and he said, but, um, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's suffering, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy if you are a reproach for Christ's name. Blessed are you for the, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. And on their part, he is blasphemed, but on your part, he is glorified. So now let me give you a few reasons now. Why is it that we consider suffering for Christ as a gift? Because that's, that, that just seems like it doesn't make sense. If you try to tell the world that suffering is a gift, they're going to think you're crazy. Might be a few Christians who might think you're crazy too. 
but it is a gift. Number one, suffering for Christ is an indication that we believe in him. Because he says, it has been granted not only to believe in him. Give, the salvation that we have is a free gift. Again, it's God's grace. We didn't earn it and we, didn't, we, we don't deserve it. But he's opened our heart to believe. Suffering marks us and sets us aside as belonging to him. We are the children of God. Secondly, suffering for Christ unites us with him. Paul would write later in chapter 3, he says, with a, with a passion of his heart, he says, I want to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering that I might be made conformable to his death. There's a oneness that we gain when we suffer with Christ. He suffered, and when we suffer for him, we are in sweet fellowship and communion with him. There's an intimate connection that we make with Christ and we can actually say that suffering is just a part of the Christian heritage. Because he says, if children then heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we also may be glorified together. And in this same verse, we see that suffering for Christ promises reward and glory. He adds in verse 18, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us, Remember, Jesus said, great is your reward in heaven when he told the Beatitudes. We can't imagine, eye has not seen, nor ear has heard, nor has entered into the heart of man the things that God has in store for those who loved him. Suffering keeps us from trusting in ourselves. When we're going through difficult times, we realize we don't have the resources. We don't have the strength. We don't have the wisdom. We're bound to call on Christ in the midst of our suffering and pain. Second Corinthians 1 Corinthians 1.9 says, Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. Then number five, suffering for Christ promotes the gospel. We've already said this because Paul said, but I want you to know, brethren, that the things that have happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. Then number six, suffering for Christ strengthens and purifies our faith. Peter, in 1 Peter chapter 1, he says, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to the praise and honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You know, there's that old saying that suffering is going to make us bitter or better. But if we're genuinely born again and we humble ourselves before the Lord and submit to whatever it is he wants to accomplish in our lives through the suffering, there is going to be great reward and our strength and our faith will be purified. Then, number seven, suffering for Christ produces sweet fellowship. Realize, however, that when we're suffering for Christ, we're never alone. Remember what he said in Hebrews, that we are one. Remember them as though we are one with him, with them. When one suffers, we all suffer, and so the whole body is suffering. Now, we don't experience it within our heart and within our bodies, but, but the body of Christ is in pain right now. And it's suffering. And you and I are called upon to pray for those who are hurting. Paul says in verse 30, having the same conflict that you saw in me and now here is in me, the New, translation, the New Living Translation says, we are in this fight together. In other words, it's your turn now to take part in the battle. You do that by prayer. But the Philippians were taking part in the suffering. That's one of the things that brought them together. The word conflict gives us our word agony from the Greek. And Paul considered them partners in the gospel, not only because they supported his ministry, but because they too were suffering even as he was. 
That's why there was such an intense love between him and them. He loved them, they loved him. Because they were both enduring suffering for Christ. Number eight, ultimately our suffering glorifies God. One through seven, you put them all together, and that equals glory to God. And I just thought of one more thing, which one of the things that, and I've said this before, some of you have probably heard me say this, suffering is a means by which God makes us like Christ. The writer of Hebrews says that the Son of God, he suffered, he learned obedience by the things that he suffered. Now, I, you know, you have to wonder, how is it that the Son of God can learn obedience? Well, the, the word learn has to be by experience. And in other words, what Jesus learned was the cost of being obedient to the Father. And if we're being obedient to the Father, then God is going to use that to make us just like his son. And none of us, that's his goal for us, that we be conformed to the image of Christ, and none of us can ever be like Christ without suffering. But it's all for God's glory. And Paul desired the saints in Philippi to demonstrate the worthiness of, the, of Christ and his gospel by the way they lived their lives in a hostile environment. Christ has purchased our eternal salvation and anything that we experience in this life for his sake makes a statement to the world of his infinite worth. And so those are some of the reasons why we can consider suffering as a gift. We're going to pray in just a minute, but um, I want to share a video with you to show you some of the kinds of things that are taking place for the sake of Christ in other parts of the world. This first video that I want to show you is about a missionary family serving the Lord in Colombia. So let me ask Tim if you'd go ahead and call that up. And let's... Uh... <laughs> Going to make it? Barely. They said fight, right? If you're late, continue. Have a good day. Tell me you were a pastor. I am. Your wife, her name is Gloria. And your baby Samuel. As you can see, I know everything about you. And I don't even know your name. Marcus. Marcus. Would you like to come in, Marcus? I can offer you some coffee. 
talk to me. I know you also talk to my rivals. How do I know where your loyalties lie? We only serve the Lord. If you want to keep that up, you will join with the other pastors in the area and work for me. If they are on your payroll, they are no longer pastors. Good luck, it's me and not some other guerrillas. They would shoot you in the head in front of your family. Consider my offer carefully. We'll go back tomorrow. Father, please give us the strength to stand in every test. And may your salvation reach many through us here in the red zone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. My mother was a Christian. I have something for you. Hold on a minute. Give this to your man and take one for yourself. You think you will make me a Christian by giving me a Bible? <laughs> I hope that you will listen to God. I will listen when I lie wounded on the battlefield. Then I will listen. Where are you going? I'm sorry, where is Marcus? You know Marcus? Yes. He's dead. How did you know him? He was my friend. Are you the pastor who gave him the Bibles? Can you bring more? Please.